Good evening, and welcome to the North Oaks Hospital Systems Public Forum. This forum is in its second year. This is the first forum that we're having this year. As chairman of the Board of Commissioners, my name is Ron Macaluso. Uh, it's truly an honor and a privilege to represent our community uh, on the uh, Board of Commissioners for the North Oaks Health System. Uh, the board members, uh, if you don't know, are volunteers and they are selected by our parish council. North Oaks is truly our community health system. And it, it began as a Seventh Ward Hospital, as you may know, but now we're a regional health provider. And we provide many services to the community. And uh, one of the more important services that we have is our Level 3 Trauma Center in our emergency department. As this name, as this event name indicates, this is a public forum that we, as the members of the board, are hosting for the health system. It is an opportunity for the health system to share information with the community in a public forum situation. And as the agenda will indicate later on to uh, answer questions that the public may have uh, regarding our mission, our goals, and the services that we provide. So this is a, a dialogue. The purpose of this is a dialogue with the community. We welcome the community input because this is truly your community hospital. So with that, thank you again for being here this evening and participating uh, in our public forum, and I would like to introduce our president and CEO, Michelle Sutton. Good evening, everyone, and I too would like to welcome you all. Before I get started, I would like to introduce several of our board members that are present this evening, our vice chairman, Ann Carruth, Ms. Joyce Lynn Lee and Mr. Blake Daniels. Thank you. It gives me great pleasure to introduce you to your executive team. Together, they have over 350 years of experience to lead this institution. I'm going to ask that they stand when I introduce them and remain standing to I call out all their names. Michael Watkins, our Chief Operating Officer. Shirley Singh, our Chief Financial Officer. Diane Thompson, our Chief Nursing Officer. Dr. Rob Helshe, our Chief Medical Officer. Percival Kane, our Chief Ambulatory Officer. John Derenbecker, our Chief Legal Officer. Sybil Paulson, our Rehabilitation Hospital Administrator. Jeff Jaro, our Chief Human Resources Officer. Tracy Randazzo, our Vice President of Strategy and Outreach, Larry Daigle, our Vice President of Performance Management, and Dr. Herbert Robertson, our Chief Health Informatics Officer. Thank you. <laughs> Healthcare truly is our passion. It's our calling. Like our mission, we work tirelessly to improve lives every time, every touch. We could not make these differences without our employees, community members feedback, and leadership. At this time, I'd like to recognize members of our North Oaks Foundation Board, our Patient and Family Advisory Council, and our volunteers. If any of you all are present, if you would please stand. Okay, thank you. This week, we celebrate both National Hospital Week as well as National Nurses Week. If you look around the room, our nurses have prepared posters to talk about the care that they provide in their individual units. The theme is inspire, innovate, and influence. And those, per those posters indicate just how they do that. So I would encourage you at the end of the program to please walk around the room and look at those. Because one of the most important things a hospital can do is recruit and retain outstanding staff. 
And so at this time, I'd like to ask Dr. Rob Pelche to come forward to talk about our new doctors. Good evening. Thank you for coming. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing, uh, or at least showing some pictures. And uh, I don't have pictures of all of them yet, because some of them aren't quite here yet, but uh, the physicians that we've added this particular year. Dr. Darren Rowan. Turn around. I'm sorry sometimes to see some of these. Uh, who's up next? Um, Dr. Darren Rowan uh, is a general surgeon. Uh, he's been practicing uh, for uh, 20 plus years now. We were lucky enough to obtain him from uh, the Covington area to come and work with us. Uh, and he's been with us for about two or three months now. Uh, Dr. Baptiste is a uh, right out of residency and is a hospitalist. And for those of you who aren't familiar with hospitalists, they're usually family practitioners or internal medicine physicians who uh, practice exclusively in the hospital. Uh, Dr. Lissauer is an anesthesiologist. He's a John Hopkins Medical School and residency trained anesthesiologist who was working at West Jefferson and uh, decided to join our team a few months back as well. Dr. Nadi is a, um, a, a hospitalist working for us currently. He is a, uh, f he's done a fellowship in infectious disease as well and is working part-time for us as uh, in our hospital medicine group. Dr. Magnus Lawson is a hospitalist as well, doing some part-time work for us. He comes from us via New York where he uh, went to Columbia. We have two plastic surgeons, Dr. St. Hilaire and I'll just fast forward, come back to, uh, and Dr. Stalder. Both are at LSU. Uh, Dr. St. Hilaire is the uh, chairman of the department, and uh, Dr. Uh, Stadler is one of their uh, staff uh, plastic surgeons. They are working with us uh, in a basis to help us uh, keep some of our surgeries that we were losing. Uh, for ex a good example is general surgery. Uh, when, some, when a female needs to have a mastectomy, we weren't able to provide both sides of the mastectomy and the reconstructive surgery. So now that we have uh, these two guys helping our general surgeons out, we can provide that service and stop having people having to go somewhere else to have some of those procedures done. A new nephrologist, Dr. Muhammad, is working with Dr. Rab's group. Uh, comes from us as well from uh, SUNY in uh, New York. Um, Dr. Abagayam is from uh, Wayne State University and did his residency in Bogalusa. We've uh, been lucky enough to, in the past few years, obtain many residents from the Bogalusa Family Practice uh, Program. And if you don't know, uh, that's the good thing about having family practice or any residency program, whether that's New Orleans or Baton Rouge or anywhere close to you, residents tend to stay, 80% of residents stay within 50 miles of the residency program that they uh, train at. Dr. Willis uh, Spence was, was with us 20 years ago and chose to move back to Shreveport, Louisiana to raise his family uh, about 18 years ago, and, uh, but always loved working here. And so as soon as his family finished high school, he called us and said, I want to move back. And so uh, luckily, Dr. Willis has uh, fulfilled some needs in our emergency department and uh, is working full time for us uh, over the past month and a half. Uh, and here's a list of uh, physicians that have joined our staff that will be starting in the next few months. Uh, Dr. Al Corey is a neurologist, but he's a critical care neurologist, comes via, uh, originally he was a, a Tulane professor of neurology and uh, works on the North Shore and has joined uh, our um, medical staff. Dr. Willingham, and you'll see the very last one, Dr. Pathak is um, physical medicine rehab, That's a, um, works at our CMR unit doing uh, rehabilitation for people that have had knee replacements, strokes, those kinds of things. Dr. Payne is a neurosurgeon, will be doing some part-time work, especially helping our trauma program out. Casey Steen is another hospitalist who is finishing his training and, uh, on July 1st at uh, um, LSU Lafayette's program, uh, internal medicine program. Uh, Dr. Ingolia is an internist who will be doing clinic practice joining the North Shore Internal Medicine uh, uh, group. Uh, Dr. Talabinejad is a trauma surgeon uh, who will also be joining us this summer. Dr. Carr in emergency medicine. Dr. Raplansky will be uh, completing our uh, emergency medicine uh, group, which has grown large now, of over 20. And then Dr. Owens is a general surgeon who will also be uh, working uh, in the area with our group. Um, does anybody have any questions about any of the additions to the staff? Thank you.
Making a difference in improving lives starts with innovation and next comes teamwork. North Oaks is certified by the Joint Commission of Accreditation of Hospital Organizations as a primary stroke center. We added three new services to complete our stroke service line. We're the only hospital on the North Shore to do this. I'd like to share one family's experience. Please join with me in recognizing Mr. and Mrs. Sterling as we share their story with you. So if you all would please stand. Thank you. We started these new procedures in January of this year. And so this is their story. You know, I didn't, I didn't know nothing was wrong with me. It hadn't been for her. I don't know what would happen. And she, she had, she had to work with all the, to look at me and tell something was wrong. She, she said she could tell it in my speech and in the way I was looking. I told him I was going to call 911. He said, no, I'm not going to no doctor. I said, yes, you are. And I went right on and called 911. And uh, the girl asked me a few questions and, you know, verified my address. And uh, they was at the house in about 10 minutes. Then the Caden came and he came in and went right to work at him, looked at him. It wasn't, it wasn't three minutes, two or three minutes. He checked his, you know, a few things and asked him a few words, you know, questions. And then he got on the phone and he called for the helicopter. He thought I needed to go immediately. He said I, he needs to get there. He needs to get there fast. So in just a few minutes, the helicopter landed right at my house. And they rolled me out there. I told him, I said, I can walk over there. He said, no, today you're going to ride. He, he left and he said, just the last thing he seen, he was flying over uh, our, son's, our house. son's house. And he, uh, that was pretty much it. And he said, the, the driver said something about being there. And he said, you mean you're in Hammond? And you said. <laughs> I told him he didn't have to fool with the traffic like I did. <laughs> They had asked her where they wanted to go, and I told them I wanted to go to North Oak. And uh, that's where they brought me. And thank goodness they did, because they saved my life. They was real fast. Everybody was on cue. Uh, we went. I wasn't in there probably a, maybe a little less than an hour. They had me checked, did the procedure, and rolled me to a room in about an hour's time. And it wasn't no time that they had opened them doors and told me to come on in. And he was very alert and didn't look nothing like he did when I seen him last. You know that morning. I was relieved. I was so relieved to see that everything was, you know, okay. So it's just... Well, that was I my normal self? You were your normal self, yeah. And the outcome was remarkable. And everybody, even the little uh, ENTs came to the waiting room... To see and, me. ...and told me that everything was going well, from what he could understand. He didn't know for sure then, but, uh, you know, they, the two men were just uh, very nice, considerate, and compassionate. One even hugged me. Because <laughs> <laughs> I guess I had a terrible look on my face. It was a little scary, but I actually I didn't have time to be scared. When it was over with, it was over. I mean, I, I was back at my old self. And, 
And most, a lot of the procedure and all, I don't even remember it. I just woke up in the room and I was fine. But what's scary is to think about it, uh, sitting there and not, didn't, I didn't hurt nowhere, my head didn't hurt or nothing, and have something like that happen to you. And then they was able to stop it right there before it did something real serious. And corrected it. And they corrected it on the spot with that little that procedure they did. And it's just, like I say, I, I, I don't remember anything happening. Uh, time I got here, they wheeled me in, took care of me, and I woke up, it was all over. But it's scary to think about it, but it's good that they brought me here. I would tell every, each and every one of them, from the ambulance driver to the helicopter pilot, techs and nurses, doctors, everybody, thank you for what you did for me. It's just remarkable what all y'all together as a group did. Everybody, everybody. Mr. and Mrs. Sterling, please. We thank you for entrusting your care to us. At this time, I'd like to introduce Roger Rivette. He's our interventional radiology manager to talk about exactly what we did to improve Mr. Sterling's life. Well, recently, we, uh, last year, we were able to get on board a neurointerventional radiologist, uh, Dr. Zachary Liner. And with that, we brought a lot of new procedures. One of them was the one we used on Mr. Sterling. Uh, it's called intracranial mechanical thrombectomy. So it's the treatment of stroke. There are two different kinds of stroke. One's a hemorrhagic stroke, one's an ischemic stroke. Uh, what we dealt with here was an ischemic stroke, and that's what we can treat. That is where the, bl uh, the, the blood flow is blocked by either a clot or a plaque, and it decreases the blood flow going to a certain portion of the brain. Depending on what portion of the brain depends on what's affected and the severity and, and how bad it can be. So in a, intracranial mechanical thrombectomy, we go in through the groin, we go up with different various microcatheters, wires, and we go all the way up to the affected vessel in the brain. Once we get to the clot, we go through the clot and we deploy a device called a stent retriever. Using a balloon guide catheter and with the aid of a suitable guide wire, the microcatheter is advanced through the occlusion and positioned distal to the clot for accurate deployment. The guide wire is then removed, and with the aid of fluoroscopic imaging, the Trevo Pro View Retriever is carefully advanced up through the microcatheter. Trevo Pro View is visible under fluoroscopy for accurate placement and observable strut behavior. After positioning and unsheathing Trevo, allow time for maximum clot integration. With its vertical strut orientation and tailored radial strength, the Trevo ProView Retriever is engineered specifically for efficient clot integration. In addition, Trevo's tubular stent retriever design and spiral cell alignment conform to the vessel with uniform cell area and no cell overlap. Enhanced conformability promotes excellent clot integration regardless of tortuosity. Prior to retraction, the balloon guide catheter is inflated to occlude flow. The Trevo Pro View Retriever and microcatheter are then pulled down as a unit while slowly aspirating through the balloon guide catheter. Vigorous aspiration is started through the balloon guide catheter as Trevo and the microcatheter are removed and full revascularization is verified. 
So a lot of people may ask, when we're doing this, what happens to the little pieces of clot that may go forward? Well, we supply suction at three different points to keep the flow going the opposite direction so no clot goes the wrong way. Using. This is just an example of the uh, stent retriever before and a stent retriever after. This is a before and after image of a typical cerebral angiogram. The A is the before we go in, that's what we first see. The B is after we remove the clot. You can see the difference in the, the blood flow there. This is actually the clot we removed from Mr. Sterling. Now that's, that's not the whole clot, that's the part that we got in one piece. A lot of it went into the suction canister, but that's the part that was on the stent retriever. This is actually Mr. Sterling's before and after pictures. So our first picture here is our very first picture we took in the brain. And you can see where the blood just stops right there. And then after we remove the, the clot, we take another shot to see how we look because we may have to go in and do it again. So after our first pass, we got the whole clot and that was with a flow afterwards. And in fact, when, when we first saw Mr. Sterling in the ER, he was flaccid on his left side, left arm dangling, difficulty speaking. Uh, we put him on the table. It was hard to understand what he was even saying. And we did the procedure, it took a little over 50 minutes. And when we were finished, we woke him up and he said he was ready to go eat some ribs. <laughs> he even invited us to his house and he said he'd make us some ribs. <laughs> and I, I think he really didn't even realize that anything had happened, to tell you the truth. But everybody, even our staff, was all amazed at the result. They, nobody was expecting to be that vivid of a result. So what makes it a real game changer, it's been around for a while, but it, there's new literature from the Dawn trial that was just recently published. And this is what we're basing our, this is the data we're using to base our program off of. And it opens up the time frame to treat stroke for us for 24 hours. Uh, you can still get three to four hours. You can still get TPA, which is the clot bu busting drug, but we can treat if it's a if you're a candidate we can treat up to 24 hours and which is a really big one we can treat a wake-up stroke which means we don't know when the last time we saw you well was but you woke up with stroke symptoms um, and this is it doesn't matter if we can wait 24 hours the sooner we get in the, is the better so if you are having signs and symptoms of a stroke weakness slurred speech or if your family member recognizes it, then you need to seek treatment immediately. Uh, it's shown that every minute that passes, 1.9 million neurons die, and that's irreversible brain damage, which could, could mean you can't talk, can't walk, you can't take care of yourself. So th this is big for our community because we're the only place on the North Shore doing it right now. Our next new procedure is something a little different, but it's called chemoembolization. It's made for uh, liver tumors. Uh, it's something called TACE, trans arterial chemoembolization. It's where we go into the actual tumor. We go to the feeder vessels through the groin again, and we inject specially impregnated beads that have chemo in them. So at the same time that we're blocking off the blood supply, we're also treating the tumor with chemo without having to give you chemo through your whole body. This is a video of the procedure. You go into the feeder vessels and you can see right there where they're injecting the beads. The beads are all the same exact size, so it fills the vessels. It doesn't clump up and not go all the way out to the periphery. And basically, we just fill it up, and then we're going to move on to the next vessel. Unfortunately, you cannot do all the vessels at one time. A lot of times you have to bring the person back. But th this is a, um, a very good, we weren't doing this just a year ago. Lastly is treatment for brain aneurysms. So one treatment is you go and you have to have surgery where they cut into your skull. 
we can do it through the groin, same approach as our other procedures, and go up to the vessels in the brain. And if you have an aneurysm, which is a weakened area on that blood vessel, and the, the blood keeps pushing on it, it makes it weaker, it makes it thinner, and it has a chance for rupturing. So what we want to do is avoid that, but if it does rupture, we can also treat a ruptured aneurysm. Um, we use the same technique, microcatheters through the groin, different uh, catheters, wires. We do a cerebral angiogram first. That's just an example of what a cerebral angiogram looks like. And we locate the aneurysm. As you can see, the, the bulging area in the middle, and this one has a very wide opening so if we tried to use the coiling technique, the coils would come right back out. So for this, we use something called a flow diverter. Place the flow diverter right over the neck of the aneurysm. It diverts the flow from going into the aneurysm, and ultimately the aneurysm will go away, and you have no chance of rupture. The other method is very similar, except for we go all the way up into the aneurysm, and we fill it full of coils. And by doing that, it fills it up, it protects it, there's no chance for rupture. And that's a much better situation. Uh, we have treated, so far, ruptured and unruptured since we started this in January, February time period. And after that, any questions? Okay, thank you. Excellent, thank you very much. I'm Herbert Robinson, and I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about predictive analytics at North Oaks Health System. Uh, I've gotten to speak at one of the community forums before. We talked a little bit about sepsis and the detection of sepsis, and I'm gonna share with you a little of the um, developing technology that we're using here at North Oaks, and um, how we can apply the use of advanced computerized technology directly to the care of our patients. Many of you may have seen commercials on TV about the power of AI, there's some very descriptive commercials that come on and talk about the use of these new types of platforms and how we can use computers to do things like build these jet engines and all these things that are more efficient. Um, but we like to use them uh, in our business, which is healthcare, which is taking care of sick people and taking care of you. And we'd like to share with you a little bit about what we're doing. And I've got a little bit of finagling to do here, so you have to forgive me. So from the time that a patient comes to our hospital, we start collecting information. And um, just as we saw before, as soon as the patient arrives, and sometimes even before, we're collecting information, maybe even from the ambulance before the patient showed up. Things such as the vital signs and blood pressure, medications that you may be on or that we're giving you early on in your stay. We're gonna have to... Laboratory test results, which we collect on you once you've arrived, many from your blood tests. We may measure volumes of medications that we've given you or IV fluids, and all of this is going into our electronic record. You may have x-rays and other types of ancillary tests. You'll be put on a cardiac monitor in many instances to make sure that your heart's working properly. You also will give us information about your health that we may ask, such as, um, you know, have you had a previous history of heart disease or a stroke? Some of those answers may be positive, some may be negative. We'll record those. We'll have a list of problems that you may have. If you've been to North Oaks before, we may already contain a list of problems that you have so that we can help care for you, not only in the hospital, but outside of the hospital. We also have the ability, if you're at other providers, to share information across state lines um, so that we can get your health care records wherever you may have been before so they can go into our system to help us make decisions about how to provide the best care for you. The one additional thing we can do is now that we have your information about you as we're collecting it, which is pretty much a continuous process if you've ever been in the hospital, we can take that and compare that information against literally a million other people who may have had similar problems, maybe similar test results as you, maybe similar, type, similar types of medical conditions as you, as you have, and we can use that to help us make better decisions about what might be wrong with you and help give information to your providers that they may be looking for. Once we have that information, we're able to show things such as uh, alerts and other types of decision support tools to help cue providers, doctors, and nurses into things that may be wrong with you 
or sometimes just to make it easier for them to find things that they want to do so that their work will be more efficient in, the, in them providing care for you. Once we have that picture of you, and this is kind of an example of some of the information we might pull out, this is about 120 items. Nurses and doctors are typically reviewing close to 1,000 items on you in the course of your stay, and sometimes many thousands of items if you're staying. Wouldn't it be great if we could use computers to find the most important information and display it to providers as they come on and off of your case so that immediately they know the most important pieces of information? This would be an example of that. Often we're presenting smaller amounts, not 100. Sometimes it's just six or seven things. But it can certainly help save time if someone's looking for something in an emergency. The additional thing that we can do is we can use predictive analytics to the extent that we can sometimes take information about you and predict what may happen to your health in the near future or the conditions that may, um, that may occur during your hospitalization. This is just an example of an easy graph where there's a percentage on the left side and then the other um, parts of the graph, you can see there's one part that particularly sticks out higher than the others. That can help us cue us, cue us in to certain types of illnesses that may be specific to you or give us percentile rankings. What are the odds that this is wrong with me? What are the odds that I'm having a stroke? What are the odds that I'm having a heart attack? Um, with that in mind, I'd like for um, Kevin Fussell, our Health and Business Analytics Director, to come talk a little bit about our department and uh, a couple of the methods that we use. Hi, thank you, everybody. Um, so as you can see, there's a ton of information that's made available to us through our electronic health record system. And as Dr. Robinson mentioned, throughout your stay, all of your caregivers are going through and entering all this information about you. So this diagram kind of walks through different things, you know, your vital signs. If you're hooked up to a monitor, it's monitoring, you know, your pulse rate, your, your um, blood pressure, all of your lab results, um, diagnoses, even your family history. So being able to take all those items into one and review them collectively, that really gives you a good picture of your current health. So in health and business analytics, um, we take and apply advanced statistics and machine learning techniques to find the patterns that are in this information. They may be somewhat hidden, so we look through and we try to find out what's the likelihood that you may develop you know, a certain condition or a certain disease. Um, so we work together. We try to develop a predictive model. Um, we build it, we test it, we establish, hey, if you have these features or these factors, um, you're very likely to either have this condition or maybe there's a way that we can prevent this condition from occurring. So once we have that model pr um, produced, we work very closely with our caregivers to develop decision support and other care advisories so that we can put this at the forefront and alert them to any kind of potential risk that you may encounter throughout your stay. Um, so every time that that caregiver is entering information about you, um, every time that one of those systems is you know, calculating your blood pressure, your pulse, um, the system is now automatically evaluating what is my risk? Has my risk gone up since the last time that I've been evaluated? And if it does detect an increased risk, it knows to alert the caregivers to that so that they can take and um, provide intervention more quickly. So the sooner that you can identify and begin treating the conditions, the overall better your outcomes will be. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Robinson who will speak more to some of our new developments. So just to briefly reiterate um, some of the great work that has been going on at North Oaks, once again, we're collecting information. This may be something on, that's been collected on a patient as they show up in our ED, but we don't take care of just one patient at a time. We take care of a lot of patients at a time. And it takes a lot of people looking at a lot of information to make the best decisions about health care. Our nurses and physicians are great at that, and they do a good job of that. But wouldn't it be nice if we could help them and the system every 15 minutes is looking behind the scenes to look for changes in patients' conditions. It can pick them out, as you can see here, and then it can single them out for needing special intervention. And as we look here, and I uh, don't obviously can see the arrow, so good it showed up there, sorry. Um, you can see there's a peak here. So if we look at this over time, this might be a patient coming in and we're measuring a particular score. It could be related to heart failure. It could be related to respiratory failure. It could be related to liver problems. Over time, as the computer detects problems, the score will go up. And when you see spikes in the score, like where the arrow points, it can help single that patient out so that we can then alert caregivers or provide additional information to helping them. But what we're doing that we feel is new and that you will be seeing probably more about um, in the 
coming future, is that what if we could move that forward in time, and before we had the big problems, we had the small problems. The computer can look at a lot of things at once, and sometimes it can detect patterns even before they happen. And what if it could detect it a day and a half or two days before it happened? We think there's a lot of types of things that occur to our patients that the sooner that we can predict them, we might even be able to prevent some of those occurrences. Um, this is not something that is experimental. This is something that we're working on right now and are able to do in some instances. But we do have some new developments associated with this. And one of those would be just to uh, alerting our caregivers. Some things we can do is we built applications that can then notify the caregivers at the time that this is received, either by text message or by other types of uh, mechanisms that we have to communicate with our nurses. This is under development. Um, but we expect it to be active pretty soon. Um, we're working with our EMR vendor to make sure this is up and running. But this is just an excellent example of things that go on behind the scenes you might not be aware of that are looking over, over your shoulder while you're here and trying to make sure that you get the best care as well as your nurses and providers who take excellent care for you every day. So a little something behind the scenes we wanted to share. Thank you. So as Dr. Robinson said, now we've shown you what we can do actually with the patient, improving lives, then behind the scenes, the difference they're making. And they're a little modest, but I will share with you, they just got back last week from Epic, which is our, um, our electronic health vendor in Wisconsin. Epic has 68% of the market. There are over 400 health systems worldwide that use Epic. And they were one of five teams that have developed this algorithm that they were able to show. And others are now coming to Hammond, Louisiana to see what they're doing and how they're improving lives with this predictive analytics. So we're very proud of them. OK, another way that we're making a difference is through our partnership with the Louisiana Organ Procurement Agency. During the month of April, that is Organ Donation Awareness Month. And one way that we can make a difference is to help people by becoming an organ donor. 120,000 people are waiting for life-saving organ transplants. Hundreds of thousands more are in need of corneas and tissue transplants. An average of 22 people die each day because organs are not donated in time. One donor can save or help save the lives of 75 people. In 2017, North Oaks had four donors which saved 13 lives. Eight tissue donors enhanced more than 100 lives and had 29 eye donors that gave the gift of sight. So far in 2018, we've had three organ donors which saved 13 lives, four tissue donors that enhanced more than 200 lives, and 10 eye donors that gave the gift of sight. I'd like to introduce you now to a very special mother, Melissa Kennedy, whose son Andrew is a hero and continues to live amongst us through his gift. Melissa. I'm not a suit and tie person. My favorite title is mom, and that is one of two that gave me that title. I was told I would never have children, and my Lord said differently. He gave me Andrew after many hours of fasting and praying. And I thought I would be the one to say goodbye first. But the Lord had other plans. And on May 1st of 2016, he was in an ATV accident and suffered a, excuse me, suffered a traumatic brain injury. That he was taken to Riverside Hospital in Washington Parish which is a small community hospital. And I could tell they looked a little lost. They asked me where I wanted him taken. I had no clue. I was still in shock. We were given suggestions. 
our cousin is an EMT and he said I would recommend North Oaks. I had never had any dealings with North Oaks previous to this. I said okay that's fine. Helicopter came, flew him to North Oaks. We went right behind. At 9.30 on May 1st that night I moved into North Oaks and I was here for three days and I received some of the best treatment as a mother that I could receive and my son received the best treatment that I could have ever asked for as a patient. The nurses were fabulous, the doctors were wonderful. If I needed something it was there even before I asked for it. They, they gave me space with my son and when it came to a point where decisions had to be made. We were, we agreed for him to be an organ donor. He had already made the decision without our knowledge. He was 22 when the accident happened. Legally, you're an adult at 21. So he had made the decision. We decided to honor it. Lopa came in. They were fabulously gracious. They agreed for us to stay with him until the very end. And North Oaks agreed as well and let us stay. They did the flag raising ceremony here. They, I remember at one point someone in the hospital staff said, I don't know who we have here, but where did all these people come from? Andrew never met a stranger and he was very popular in our parish. He had 3,000 people at his wake and he had 1,000 people at his funeral and he had 24 pallbearers. So you can imagine the people that were in and out of this hospital before he actually left it. And like I said, I had never heard of North Oaks before his incident happened. But now, I was actually here in Hammond today because I had a doctor's appointment with one of your doctors. And a lot of people ask me, why do you drive from Washington Parish past Our Lady of the Angels and don't go to Covington, why do you come to Hammond for your care? He's the reason. For two days, I watched North Oaks take care of my baby and I saw how they cared for us. And I can guarantee you, if I need any care, I will be coming here. And some people say, but they didn't save him. So why would you want to go there? It wasn't God's will for him to be saved. It was God's will for him to help save six lives and give sight to a seventh. That was God's will. It doesn't matter what wonderful technology, what wonderful minds, what fabulous doctors North Oaks has. When God says, that's what happens. I do trust North Oaks, even though he didn't make it. And since his passing in 2016, if Miss Melanie or Miss Michelle have called me and asked me in any way to promote this hospital, I have gladly done so and will continue to do so because this is an excellent facility with fabulous people working here. When we came in here, we felt like we had been adopted into a family that cared for us, cared for our son, and that's all anyone can ask for, especially when you're down. And I can honestly say, thanks to the excellent care that I got from the doctor today, my health is improving. <laughs> and, yes. So, I'm sorry. I'm not a suit and tie person, I'm a mom. And as a mom, this is where I would wanna be. Because of Andrew, my daughter has decided to become a nurse. 
Why? Not only because of Andrew, but because of the excellent nurses that she watched and she talked to while he was here getting care. She is a questioner. They never got annoyed with her. They never pushed her out of the way. They never got abrupt with her as she asked questions, as she looked and wondered. They asked any question, they answered any question that she asked. And I would like to say to Ms. <coughs> Michelle and the board that is here, thank you so much for the wonderful care that he received and that we received. And I hope that North Oaks is around for a long, long time. God bless you all. One of the reasons why we asked Melissa to share her story is because of April being Donor Awareness Month, if you haven't become a registered organ donor, we would ask you to consider it because as you heard through her son's gift, seven other people live today that wouldn't be alive otherwise. So we would ask you to consider it and we thought it was more important for you to hear a testimonial than to hear our plea for you to sign up. So now we've told you about the patient care side. Now we're gonna tell you a little bit about the business side. And Percival's like, you're making me follow this? <laughs> and we are making him because we wanna to talk to you about how we're restructuring the clinics on our campus and why we're restructuring the clinics on our campus to become provider-based. Um, so Percival. Uh, good afternoon. Clearly, I drew the short straw um, <laughs> following that testimony, which, which was beautiful. Um, so yes, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the clinics and our, our, a really exciting product that we have uh, coming up really soon. Um, and it's kind of, it's called uh, evolving to a hospital-based outpatient department. So that said, um, on June 11th, um, CMS, our Centers of Medicare and Medicaid, I was going to designate some of our North Oaks provider clinics as hospital-based outpatient departments. So it's essentially, our clinics will be departments of the hospital, which for those who don't know, as it currently stands, they're freestanding clinics, um, no different than a private practice office, if you will. So which clinics, you ask? Um, some of the, the clinics that are actually on campus. So all of our providers, our physicians, nurse practitioners, physician assistants that are actually on this campus, so either in the building right across the parking lot or in our admin building are all going to be in this hospital-based department um, designation. <coughs> so why convert clinics to hospital-based outpatient departments? Um, this model of care uh, fosters an integrated and collaborative environment where hospitals and providers work more closely and together. So essentially we are able to uh, gain some economy skills from a quality standpoint. We're able to um, ensure patient safety and a number of other, th other factors like that. Is, uh, is supported by Medicare and has been adopted by hospitals all across the country. I think the last stat I saw was somewhere north of 60% of all hospitals in, in the United States use this model. It's also very prevalent throughout the course, throughout the state of Louisiana. If you look around to our neighbors to the right or to the left of us, many of those hospitals are in this model as well. Hospital-based um, outpatient departments are held as a, held to be to a nationally recognized service and patient care standards, and this basically means that we're also going to be subject to joint commission, which I'll talk about in a second. So, why, so what you need to know about this transition, a hospital-based outpatient departments must meet all applicable Medicare rules. They must participate in joint commission accreditation process to demonstrate that they, are, they meet the standards for patient care, uh, safety, et cetera, to make sure we're providing effective care. And then the clinics located off campus don't qualify. So the cardiology practice across the street, our independence practice, our practice in Satsuma, et cetera, none of those qualify because the requirement from CMS is that you have to be 250 yards from the hospital. So what's not gonna change? Well, the way I've kind of chose to say it is, 
North Oaks is going to be still going to be North Oaks. Uh, our commitment to provide excellent patient care is not going to waver. Uh, the way you make appointments and get in to see our providers is not going to change. Uh, the way you receive services from our physicians, our nurse practitioners, our PAs, it's not going to change. It's going to be the same. Same level of quality um, is going to be provi provided to our patients. And then what may change? Um, our billing process and some of the co-payments. Um, specifically, we must follow what Medicare rules actually state for our billing, of, billing for care for providers, for hospital-based outpatient departments of the hospital. Uh, so those patients that are covered by Medicare, Medicaid, and all our VA plans, and any, any supplemental Medicare payments, they're now going to receive two bills, or what we call as what Medicare designates as a split bill. One is for the provider services, so what you, your physician, your nurse practitioner, your PA, and then another is a facility fee, so for your labs, your x rays, et cetera, they'll come in two components. Um, last but not least, your co payments uh, for outpatient services also may change depending on your insurance and any other secondary pay payer that you may have. So this specifically deals with our Medicare population is probably going to be the, the most impacted by the change. And this really is contingent upon what your policy actually looks like, and that, that would dictate what your terms actually will, will look like. So that said, um, we're encouraging all of our community members and constituents that are actually going to be potentially impacted or experience this to please reach out and call this number here, 985-230-2580. We have a group of people who are actually ready to be able to answer and field any questions. They're going to work with you on an individual basis to talk about what your out-of-pocket expense will be, if anything at all, and we're certainly looking forward to being to help you. So that being said, uh, that's all. So thank you. So as Ron said, this is your time. We're going to open the floor for any questions that you have or any input that you'd like to share. If you don't want to ask out loud, you can pass, fill out your cards that are on your seat. And if you, if you just hold them up, a member of our team will come pick them up and we'll just read the question to you. Anyone? I was going to be quiet tonight, but I've got a question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Gary. Well, when I saw Dwayne Merrick walk in, is there any way um, our communities looked into the feasibility? Our fire department, every two years, as probably many of you know, we have to be recertified as much as And I don't know what, I don't understand all the politics or whatever going on that group, but it is a chore to find certified instructors. I mean, Chief Drawer, it, it, it's really a chore. Can't speak for other departments, but if we're having that problem, um, I'm wondering if there's some way to collectively the resources through the Department for the Tangible Fire District 2, one up there with Chief Trevor, and you guys, where the, as these departments, as these certifications roll around, we don't have that problem. I mean, he was pulling his hair out trying to find certified instructors. Now, we got to, I think one of them your your folks, and we start next month. But every two years, it's a problem for us. Mm -hmm. It seems like it's got to be a better way to do it. Everybody's got to go. Okay. So, so yes, we we'll share. So, yes, we can help you. Personal was just sharing with me through our occupational health department. They do that. So, I will put him in touch with you there. So we, uh, we have a kind of a combination of our occupational practice and our rehab facility. We've been talking about doing this for fire departments, police departments that are providing the service. So, we, we know it's an outstanding issue. So, we'd love to do that. Thanks. You're welcome. Anything else? Okay, Mr. So folks, what you think about our hospital? Pretty good, huh? And, and listen, I'm, I'm standing up here, but I am just uh, this much of a part of what you see on this campus. And as a board member, uh, along with uh, Ms. Lee, Dr. Carruth, Blake Daniels, Dr. Bob Barsley, we're just passing through. And we're following the trail and we're following the leadership of people that have been on this board that are now out in the community. And uh, we have two members here. 
Mr. A.J. Bodker from Ponchatoula, who was uh, chairman of the board and served uh, 12 years, wasn't it, Mr. A.J.? Dr. James Nelson was on the board. Uh, the, you know, the current board members, we're just volunteers. We're just passing through, trying to represent the community as best we can. And this hospital is a reflection of our community. And you've seen tonight two stories from Mr. and Ms. Sterling and Ms. Melissa Kennedy. Thank you so much. That is why this hospital is here. For these people, for you, your family, for your neighbors. We need your support. So when you hear these testimonials, and there are hundreds of them, it doesn't mean that everything here is perfect. Technology is changing. Medicine is changing. Training is changing. But this system is pointed in the right direction. But what we need is community support to be a community hospital. So share your experiences, what you've heard, with your neighbors. And look, we know that there are perceptions out there about North Oaks. Historical perspectives, some based in fact, some based in just random conclusions. But be proud of this system. Uh, I know I'm sounding like a little bit like a cheerleader, and that's exactly what I want to do. This is your hospital system. So we, get, we don't have any more questions. Some, nobody has some. Uh, if you're just unaffiliated with the hospital and you're just here as a member of the community, raise your hand for me. Let's see how many people we have here. And I knew Gary Sandiford was going to ask a question. I, I don't, I'm surprised that it was only one. Thank you, Gary, for being here. And for, for the members of the community that was here, next time you see this in the paper or next time you, you see uh, this uh, advertised for a public forum, please come back and please encourage your neighbors and your friends to come. And we're going to be reaching out to other areas of our, uh, uh, our market area, our service area, where our patients are, uh, come from, and our neighbors, uh, so that we can, this message can be carried out there. So if there's anything that you can do, we like to see you here in this Brent Dufresh Center, and not necessarily in the emergency room. But please carry the message that this is a fine medical center improving the the what you saw is to me almost pure magic uh this technology and these uh, surgeries that are taking place here uh this is cutting edge what what is happening here so i'm just rambling on but i wanted to share some of uh, my perceptions as a member of your community as a friend and a neighbor to many of you so thank you very much for coming, and I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Please come back.